Remember Chris McDougall, the author of Born to Run who put barefoot running on the map and who I once traded surf lessons for barefoot running lessons with? Well, Chris has a new book, Running with Sherman. It's so entertaining. It's about adopting a neglected donkey, teaching it to run, and so much more. On this show, we talk about everything from what you can learn from animals. So if you have a pet or love animals, this is definitely a great listen. Why having a purpose is important, not only for animals, but humans too. How to run with a donkey, which is actually a real sport, and so much more. If you love animals and pets, you're in for a treat. I'm a huge Chris McDougall fan. He's become a good friend. Let's jump right in. I'm Shelby Stanger, and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living. So here's what happened, Shelby. My daughter got in her head when she was nine years old that she wanted a donkey. That's a pretty bizarre request for any nine-year-old anyway. But in our case, it made a slight amount of sense because we live way out in the countryside in Pennsylvania Amish country. Um, There literally is not a house within viewing distance of our home. And our closest neighbors are Amish and Mennonite farmers. So, you know, we've, we've adopted like sheep and goats and some cats over the years, but a donkey, a donkey was next level. And I w- wasn't completely taking it seriously, but I wasn't ruling it out. And then when one of our neighbors told us that there was a guy in his church who had a problem with animal hoarding and he had a donkey mm. and they wanted to get it out of that stall, I'm like, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll take this donkey. The problem was... When the donkey was finally extracted from the hoarder and dropped off at our house, I had no understanding of what kind of dire condition this thing was in. Uh, its, its hooves were like a foot long. It couldn't walk. Teeth were falling out of its mouth. It was just completely matted. So we immediately just sort of swirled into this last-ditch rescue operation to just try to keep it alive. And that involved a lot of things like trimming the hooves with a hacksaw and pulling its teeth and shaving its fur. Chris McDougall is a repeat guest of the show and a big mentor of mine. Before becoming a New York Times bestselling author, Chris was a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press. His fascination with the limits of human potential led him to write his first book, Born to Run, an international bestseller, which changed the running shoe industry forever. His second book, Natural Born Heroes, started with a story about the Cretan heroes of World War II and took readers through Chris's own quest for ancient techniques for endurance, sustenance, and movement. His current book, Running with Sherman, is my favorite yet. It has a much more personal touch and story. As you heard him talk about in that introduction, Chris's family adopted a donkey a few years ago. Adopting a dog is a big choice for some, but a donkey is something else entirely. This donkey named Sherman needed serious rehab, not just for his hooves and fur, but for his mind as well. You told us a little bit about who Sherman was. He was from this hoarder. You had to clean him. You had to cut off his hooves with a saw. And then you decide the best way to save this donkey is to teach this donkey to run. How did you even figure out that there was such a thing as burrow racing? Was this from your research with Born to Run and maybe like your experience with Leadville? Yeah. So what happened was, you know, when there's an emergency, your brain just kind of sends out tentacles in every direction for something you might have experienced that could somehow be relevant and save the day. So what happened was when, when Tanya, our friend Tanya, was trying to keep this donkey alive. Because, you know, the major problem with any equine is if it can't walk, it can't digest. And it gets colicky very quickly, and its Mm. intestines block up. So the major problem with Sherman was if we couldn't get him moving really quickly, then we would have to put him down. And so Tanya said, now, look, you just can't stick him out in a field with a bow on his tail like Eeyore. You got to give this donkey a job. It's got to move. I'm like, what job am I going to give a donkey? Like, I'm not like a pioneer. Like, what am I going to do with this thing? And then I did remember that about 10 years earlier, I had first gone to Leadville, Colorado to research the Tarahumara Indians who had come to Leadville and had 
triumphed like magnificently in the Leadville Trail 100 back in the 90s. And I went there to sort of investigate that whole story. But while I was there, I met the race director, Ken Clover, and he told me about this Leadville tradition of burrow racing. And that's what first hooked him on, on Leadville. He was there to visit from Oklahoma, and he sees a bunch of rowdies running down the street, hanging on their ropes, attached to a bunch of like stampeding donkeys. And it turns out this was the annual Leadville Burrow Race, a 22-mile race where people, men and women, have donkeys, and you have like a 15-foot lead rope, and you and the donkey run side by side up into the mountain and back again. You can't ride the donkey. You and the donkey are essentially race partners. So Ken had told me about this, and I actually went back that year and tried my hand at burrow racing, and I was dismal, dismal. I was too bad to even be last place. I couldn't even get my donkey to go the full route. But, you know, 15 years later, I'm back in Pennsylvania, and I got this sick donkey that needs a job, and the wheels kind of start spinning. And I'm like, you know, I wonder if I can't teach this donkey how to run. Wow. So this is a process of getting this donkey to run. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, I, I, I learned something really, I guess, useful about myself, but really kind of embarrassing and humbling about myself, which is that, you know, I like to talk, I like to tell a good story, but I'm not really a good communicator. And that means like, you know, communication is looking somebody in the eye, thinking, noticing, observing, listening before you open your mouth. And I ignore every one of those five steps up to the open your mouth part. The thing about a donkey is if you're going to persuade a donkey to do anything, you've got to let the donkey think it was his idea in the first place. He ain't going to do anything unless he wants to and he thinks that you're following him. So now the problem is, how do you communicate to this donkey that it wants to go out for a run if you can't use language? And he's extremely distrustful and traumatized and has hooves which have not been useful for eight years of its life. Like, how do you transmit into this donkey brain that he thinks that he wants to get up tomorrow morning and go for a five-mile jog? So that's what I was faced with. I mean, I don't know if that's true because you've written a lot of really great books where you had to be observant of other people, but it sounds like you've learned a whole new level of communication with the donkey, which is useful in life. Like having to have someone think it's their idea has always been a good thing in business. And it's a great thing sometimes in relationships, not manipulative, but like in a, in a teamwork <laughs> sort of way. You know, yeah, it, it, there's a lot to unpack there, but you know, what happened over time was I sort of got absolutely nowhere with Sherman for quite a while. Uh, Sherman was not down to clown even a little bit. And when things started to change was when we started to recruit other partners. So where, where we live, there's an Amish running club um, called Vela Springa, which is a Pennsylvania Dutch phrase for let's run. And so our local Amish running club does a monthly full moon run. So under the full moon, a bunch of people get together at someone's farm and we'll all go on a five or six or 10 mile run together in the darkness under the moonlight. It's awesome. So I started to think, hey man, these Amish dudes not only are sizzling fast runners, I mean, they're, they're all like sub three hour marathoners, but they know horses. They've been raised on horses since birth. So these guys might be pretty good. So they all came out for a moonlight run and we took uh, Sherman out and another donkey, our neighbor Tanya's donkey. And Sherman was just like hall of fame instantly. And I thought, what's going on here? Is it, is it the Amish dudes? Is it, is it the full moon? Like, what is it? And I realized it was all that and none of that. It was the herd. The fact that when we took Sherman out, suddenly he was surrounded by like 15 bodies. It was me and Tanya and her donkey and the Amish dudes and our friend Laura Klein, who's a great runner. And it just finally clicked in my head, man, that donkeys are herd animals. He doesn't want to be broken away. He's been alone for eight years in a box, man. He's been in solitary. The last thing he wants to do is be by himself. But you surround him with lots of runners, and suddenly it's like party time. It really adjusted my like 
keyboard, you know, like my, my soundboard of my brain to dial up a couple things and dial down others where I sort of use my eyes more and then try to deal with each creature on its level by what it wants, what it's reacting to. What I found so interesting in reading this book is there's this underlying thread of purpose. And when you give the donkey a purpose, when you gave certain humans and characters in the book purpose, things sort of fell into place. I mean, you've done all these books about human performance and survival and and how we can be better at everything. You know, what did you learn about our need for purpose and how that's so eminent for survival? So I, I got to give a shout out right here to Alexandra Horowitz. She is this brilliant, first of all, she's an amazingly fluid and gifted writer, uh, but she's also like a psychologist who specializes in researching how dogs think. And that's exactly, that's like the title of one of her books, like How Dogs Thinks. So Alexandra Horowitz is probably the leading voice in dog psychology. She was giving a talk about an hour and a half drive from my house. And I knew she was going to be there that night. So I go racing over and I send her an email. I said, can I just get five minutes of your time? And she's like addressing this auditorium with like 600 people in it. The last thing she needs is like some sweaty, like frantic dude researching donkeys to like grab her in the lobby. Let me just ask you a question real quick. And I was Alexandra Horowitz's like Wednesday night nightmare. But she just like took a second, took a beat, and she listened to my question, which was, now I've been told by Tanya that every animal needs a purpose, but I hadn't been told this by anybody else. And so I am doing everything possible to get Sherman to run. But in the back of my mind was this little like naggy voice saying, maybe he doesn't, maybe he doesn't want to do this. You know, maybe he really wants to be standing in the field with the, with the bow on his ass. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to go up the chain of command and ask somebody who should know. So I, I get Alexander Horowitz in the lobby and I said, look, here's the deal. We got this donkey. And my friend said that every animal needs a job. Do you think my donkey really needs a job or should we just let him be man and just chill and, and graze? And she said, um, yeah, listen, in the wild, when every creature wakes up in the morning, it opens its eyes and goes, okay, what now? What am I going to do to find shelter? What am I going to do to find food? How am I going to protect my kids? You wake up in, in the morning and your first thought is, I got work to do. But now we domesticate animals and we take away the jobs for them. I'm sorry, we take away the jobs from them or we provide the jobs for them. And so, like, you know, for cows or horses, we say, okay, listen, you know what? You're not a wandering bovine anymore. Your job is just line up and then produce milk and then go out and have babies. So here's your job. And so for horses, you're no longer, like, tear it across the, uh, the field. You're, not, you're no longer, you know, spirit stallion of the Cimarron. You're going to be, like, my jumping horse. But for a lot of animals, and particularly you see people's dogs, they don't have any purpose at all. They have no job. So they wake up in the morning, they open their eyes and go, now what? And the answer is nothing. And so basically Alexandra Horowitz signed off. She's like, yeah, man, within the limits of what is humane and natural to the animal, if you give him a job and a purpose, you're doing him a huge favor. I mean, I think we're the same. When we wake up and we know sort of what we're supposed to do or where we're supposed to go, we do a lot better when we don't know. I mean, I think that's the whole heartbeat of your podcast, man. That's exactly what Wild Ideas Worth Living is. It is this... You know, not to degrade people who are doing jobs that are sort of nine to five-ish and indoors, but it is definitely not a natural way of surviving for the human animal. You know, to be inside a cube staring at a diode screen, eating a salad out of a plastic shell over your desk, man, that is, you know, that's a far cry from you know, skinning up a tree looking for coconuts. So I think that that's it is that, you know, you need that purpose. And that purpose, I think, in its most beautiful state, braids together the whole thing, man. It's your it's your spirit, you know, what, what makes you excited. It is your body, what makes the blood go through your veins. And it is the acuity of your brain that lets you strategize. All animals, including us humans, We need a purpose. When we come back, hear Chris talk about Sherman's purpose and how they went about training for this burrow race. 
Plus, hear him talk about the physical and emotional benefits animals can bring us. I'm a big base layer fan, especially when temperatures drop and I need to go for an early morning run. This is why I was excited Smartwool released new internet technology for base layers this season. The company basically took 25 years of knitting expertise and combined it with brand new technologies to create 3D knit garments. They're designed to give wearers complete freedom in high intensity activities. What I like best is their specific ventilation and insulation zones, which keep your body temp stable and articulated flex zones so you can basically move freely in areas like your elbows and knees without your base layers bunching up or restricting you. I also like that they're made with virtually zero waste production using the finest responsibly sourced merino wool that's super soft and feels good. They're ideal for high intensity activities where you move between extreme exertion and rest. Activities like running, hiking, and skiing, and even snowboarding. You can buy the new Smart Wool Internet Base Layers exclusively at REI.com through October. Just search Smart Wool to find the product. Chris and his family were not the only ones impacted by Sherman's presence. A family friend, Zeke Cook, was having some serious issues with depression. He had to drop out of school, and when Chris found out he was back home, Chris had an idea that might help Zeke and Sherman at the same time. So there's this character in your book that I became really fond of, Zeke. So Zeke's a college kid, and he has really bad depression, but... Yeah, He becomes your training partner when you want to race Sherman. From what I know, Zeke was a swimmer all through high school as a kid, swimming like four hours a day or more. And then when all that stops, when he's in college, he goes into a really bad depression. And his sister, who also swam that same pretty grueling schedule for a kid, also experienced depression. The third sibling did not swim doesn't experience it. And you find a lot of studies. I mean, there's tons of studies that talk about why so many high caliber athletes get depression after they stop training for a huge event or, you know, they stop their training regimen or they get injured. And we can talk about how animals help with this, but so much of your books are on performance. And I relate to this, just there's been times when I've been injured and I just, it's, it's really hard for me. Yeah, you know, it's, it's again, it's, uh, it's one of these things that is such a spaghetti, ball of spaghetti of yes. factors that, that I think the most frustrating thing about it is I just wish they would call depression something else. I agree. You know, and it is so aggravating because it, it is so hard for lots of people to distinguish between a potentially lethal medical condition and like uh, be feeling bummed because, you know, mm. your boyfriend didn't call. And... The medical condition is so dangerous and so little understood that it just aggravates me. Like you got to call it something else. You know, this is not this is not the blues. This is something that can kill you, and you don't know what to do about it. And that's the scary thing about it. So, and, and you look, you know, Anthony Bourdain. Like you know, Dave Chappelle has this whole thing. Like man, if Anthony Bourdain had depression, like you know, what hope is there for me? But clearly, Anthony Bourdain was one of like the gifted children on earth. Like nobody is more charming better looking, has like the greatest freaking job in the world. And for him to succumb to depression, it was not about Anthony Bourdain had a bad week. It's that Anthony Bourdain had a bad chemical imbalance. So with Zeke and his family, it was a similar thing. You meet the Cook family. They're better looking than everybody. They're cooler. They're funnier. And yet they really struggle with depression. And And I'm not saying that to be actually facetious or anything like that. I really love the cooks because they are that. They're the best friends. They're so kind. They're always the life of the party. Zeke's mom, Andrea Cook, was the nurse at our kids' preschool. And her two kids, uh, you know, Zeke and Ashley, the two oldest kids, were really, really like national caliber competitive swimmers. And after they stopped, then suddenly it became this nosedive into serious mental health and behavioral issues leading to both of them having very life-threatening episodes. And everyone's like bewildered, like, 
why? Like, you guys especially are so young and you have so much to live for. And, and that's when, on a personal level, it, it finally sank in for me that, man, this is a scary mystery that needs extremely careful care in order to save people's lives. And we're just super lucky that Zeke came to us when uh, he was struggling and had the good fortune that at that time we were really struggling with Sherman. And Zeke shows up. And with the kind of brain he has, man, he's like, like a super like neuroscientist. He, he just graduated college. I, I think he actually developed a machine to go to a different time warp or something because the kid is unbelievably smart. But he looked at Sherman and is like, all right, that's it. This one's mine. And he just took Sherman on as his own personal project. So there's this other thing about the book that I really liked. And it's this history of how humans have really relied on animals to help us not only physically, but there's this big emotional component as well. So like we all know that there's equine therapy and if we go on an airplane now, there's a lot more animals as emotional support animals, but there's this line in your book. And I think you're, I think it's where you, you end up and I I don't want to give too much away, but you end up at a cracker barrel and you, you have your donkeys and people come up to them and pet them. And you just say animals bring out the best in people. But there's this history that, like, you figured out that's really interesting. Can you just share just a little bit about it? I just start to make the connections. Like, there's this uptick in security animals, therapy animals. I've read stories about bizarre improvements in the health of, like, cancer patients when they Mm. bring cats in for them to pet. For some reason, like, people get better and they respond better to medication and... They bring um, dogs into classes with kids who have autism, and all of a sudden, like, the behavioral changes are amazing in the kids. Oh, yeah. My my sister is—I have a niece who is on the spectrum, and she was crying the other night. She was staying at my parents' house, so at grandpa's house, and she was crying because she missed her mommy and her brothers. And they just sent these little labadoodles that they've trained so well that are adorable up to the room. She stopped crying and, like— she just was totally out of her own head and laughing and smiling. So, yes. I love the fact that somewhere there's like a, like the bat cave, there's like a bat cave full of labradoodles, like <laughs> waiting for the signal, like, just send them off. It's <laughs> pretty well, much what an... it was. It was pretty amazing. Like just the labradoodles. If, like, if she's with an animal, she's just so happy. It's wild. Yeah. But there's this stat you, you, I want you to keep going with hold of all of the, the animals and how they bring out the best in people. But there was one stat that if you could, could help me remember Someone showed a study where a woman slept next to her husband oh, and her ang- she had anxiety <laughs> and the anxiety right. was reduced. Yes. I wish I, I don't have the, the study in front of me, but there was doing a study about whether people slept better or worse with a partner beside them. And so this is, the, I believe it came out of the, of the Netherlands. I think it was a Dutch study. And they basically, you know, canvassed a, a thousand women and said, okay, so do you sleep better or worse with your husband or boyfriend or partner next to you? And it's like, like 40% of them or 35% say, oh, yeah, you know, I sleep a little bit better. I, I don't, I'm not as restless. I, I report uh, feeling more rested. Uh, I wake up fewer times in the night. But then they did the same thing with 1,000 people who slept with someone that, other than human. And in most cases, it was a dog. And it was like 85% said they sleep way better with the uh, the creature, with the dog, than with their own husbands or partners or, or basically romantic interests. Yes. And so, you know, you could say, well, maybe it's because, you know, the dogs don't thrash around very much. But anybody who slept with a dog realizes they're all over the freaking place, man. These, these things are not just lying there, you know. They're living out their own best dog life in your bed at night. So it's not that they're inert. And th- again, this got the wheels turning. So what I started to research was our anthropological history and what becomes blindingly obvious when you think about it for a second is that our greatest sense of security in the primitive world were our animal partners. You know, the second we began to partner up with animals, then suddenly our greatest worries were relieved. So our animals were our hunters. They were our early warning detection systems. They were our overhead guides if we were hunting with hawks. You know, cats are super uh, nocturnal creatures. So if you're sleeping in a cave and you've domesticated a cat, that cat can see in the dark and it can let you know if a predator is is approaching. We could ride horses after prey to get food and we could ride away, away from predators to protect ourselves. We could have animals grazing. So essentially, millions of years ago, 
when we began to domesticate animals, when animals were close at hand, our greatest survival fears were relieved. And so you knew that if you had your hands on your domesticated dog's fur, that you could close your eyes and rest well. And this became hardwired into our, into our natural ecosystem, you know, into our own psychology. We began to associate the presence of a domesticated creature with a sense of food, shelter, safety, nutrition, everything we need to stay alive. And so, you know, one thing that's super important about how our brains work is that anything that is beneficial for our survival is going to be re- rewarded with a hormonal charge. So anything that your body wants you to keep doing, it'll mm-hmm. give you a little treat to make sure you remember to do it again. Mm-hmm. That's where the whole idea of a, of a runner's high comes from. When you exercise, it's good for your physical being, so your brain gives you a little bit of like a little, a little, you know, a little dope charge, a little dopamine, a little serotonin to tell you, hey, remember that run you just did? Make sure you do it again tomorrow. And we did essentially the same thing with our partnership with animals. Our bodies realized that having animals around was a really good way for us to survive. So our brains became wired to give us a little charge, a little bit of dopamine, a little happy hormone drug, just to reinforce that behavior so we keep doing it. How long ago did we start domesticating animals in history? I forget the exact number, but it's, it's been hundreds of thousands of years. So you did learn a little bit about animals and humans and how animals can help humans emotionally. So we talked a little bit about, you know, emotional support, but what, what else did you find in your research that people are doing with animals? That's, that's pretty cutting edge. You know, it's, it's across the board. So what I did when I started this project, you know, I, I talked to Alexander Horowitz. I, I was seeing it in action in our own home as my own temperament was starting to soften and change. And I was seeing the benefits to Zeke. I was learning a lot from my Amish neighbors. You know, it's kind of funny. I, I would go over sometimes to uh, pick something up from a neighbor if I needed a tool or something, and I'd find him five o'clock in the morning just like leaning on the fence just just looking out at the cows. And I said, oh, is something wrong? Is it giving birth? He's like, no, no, I'm just just looking. And I thought, you know, it's funny. We get up in the morning, and what do we do? We grab for our phones, right? And we f- flip through our phones. This guy walks outside and looks at a bunch of, a bunch of cattle. And so I, I started, the wheels are turning, like, hmm, there, there's, there's more beneficial going on. So I, I started to do this series for the New York Times where I just traveled around to find people that were partnering with animals. And I met uh, Jenna Wogenrich, who left her uh, graphic design job to become her own one-woman farmer. And she also hunts with hawks. She traps hawks and then trains them to hunt for her. And I met a woman up in Michigan who has been raising zebras now for half her life and <clears throat> raises and trains zebras. Um, I, Talking about kids on the spectrum, uh, I started to research uh, this guy named Rupert Isaacson, who wrote this amazing book called The Horse Boy about his Mm. acutely autistic son who responded dramatically to exposure to horses. And essentially, you know, what I found was getting out of the lab and into the field, you know, scientists will just like crack their brains with all kinds of studies. But what I was finding was out in the field, people don't have time for the studies. They're just putting it into action and having amazing results. I think all this... I mean, they call it alternative medicine, alternative therapy, but it works. It's really interesting. But I think what's also fascinating me about your book is not only did you study animals, but you live in Amish country. So you're this guy from, are you from like Philly? Yeah, man. Hardcore Philly. Yeah, you're from like the city and you go to the Amish country where people are still driving like horses and carriages and you've learned some interesting lessons from them. You know, so again, I, this is a whole alien culture, man. This is like me being dropped off in the face of Jupiter. I didn't know anything about this culture. I never expected to be living anywhere near them. And I'm pretty aggressively anti-religion across the board. You know, I just think it all should be just wiped out. Just forget it. It's a pain in the ass and a joke and the cause of all human misery. So I'm showing up with a group that shares none of my background, uh, none of my, my social customs, and none of my like religious beliefs. And yet, really early on, we started to get along very well. And I think the reason why is, you know, I I dig a good story. Like, I like a good storyteller. I like someone who's willing to just tap the brakes and stop and just tell me something cool. And that's what the Amish are all about. So Mm. the Amish, 
they don't have screens. So they're not watching TV. They're not talking on phones. They're not checking out Instagram. Their entire, you know, entertainment complex is built around talking to each other. So if I stop by that farmer's place to borrow a wrench and he's looking at the cows, I'll just hang out for half an hour and just find out what's going on. And then his brother will come out and his kids will come out. And next thing you know, like five of us, 10 of us having a little chat and then I'm on my way. Um, where we live too, it is like an unbreakable social custom that you smile and wave to everybody you see, no matter how many times you see them and how far away they are. So there's one guy, uh, Sam Messler, my closest farm neighbor. He drives by my house about 15 times a day on a tractor and 15 times a day. He's waving like he hadn't seen me in a year and I'm waving back. It's funny. I, I go to New York and if I'm like running in Central Park and I see people, I'm like waving to them. And they're like, well, what the fuck do you want? <laughs> so what, what I found about the Amish is essentially the, the key, the whole purpose of their faith is that the centerpiece of life is the family and the local community. And the reason why you have a horse and buggy isn't because, like, you know, God said so. No, it's because you have a vehicle which travels too far too fast. You get too far from your home. You get too far from your your base. And so a horse and buggy only goes 10 miles an hour. So you basically stay close to home. Uh, You don't take a job that's far away. You don't go far away. You don't impulse just drive around. The reason why a telephone is out in a box in the field is because if you decide, you know, you're going to make a phone call, it better be worth it because it's four degrees outside. If you want to walk across a cornfield and make a phone call, you better really want to make that phone call. Uh, there's no screens and no movies and no television because you spend your time doing your crafts, your family, and then you rest. So I just find myself naturally really adopting a lot of what they do. And it sounds like their food is really good, too. Well, man, I'll tell you, you know, if, if you're out at five o'clock in the morning milking cows, man, you're going to, you're going to have a womp in breakfast. So yeah, uh, everything is funny. It's, uh, again, and everything, when you, when you think of everything that we feel like, oh, it's a brand new discovery, oh, kombucha, like fermented foods, locally sourced grains, like, dude, the Amish have been doing that since the 1700s. <laughs> They've been f- fermenting stuff and, you know, thinking global and eating local. And, and, and the other thing too is everything is seasonal. And so you get super stoked like when it's strawberry season like everybody's got strawberries and they're amazing and then they're gone so you just like chow and then you're done so basically the Amish were hipster before hipster was hipster Uh uh-huh so how do you actually train a donkey for a race it's not like you can tell the donkey to like hey increase your mileage by 10 percent this week and do some hill repeats on mondays It's not like they know when to push it or lay off on a race. How is training for a donkey race just so much different than that of an ultra marathon, just in terms of the actual training for yourself? It was kind of cool. So Solomon had two of its elite ultra runners, Max King and Ryan Sands. I mean, these guys are just man eaters, dominant in ultra running. Had them come out to Colorado and they paired him up with a woman named Meredith Hodges, who is by far the preeminent uh, mule and donkey trainer in the world. Uh, the best borough racers go to Meredith Hodges whenever they have a problem. And they teamed them up with two extremely experienced and fast burrows. So you got the two fastest ultra runners, the best trainer, and the two best burrows. And they put him in the world championship pack burrow race, and they got their asses kicked. I mean, there was Hal Walter is like 60 years old and he beat these dudes. There was like a 16 year old girl who beat these dudes across the board. And these guys, one guy finished dead last and one guy finished middle of the pack. And, and I saw this and I was kind of watching it with a little bit of dread. So I thought, oh man, if these guys just go out and just cream the field, then everything I've been doing for the past year is worthless because I'm trying to train this donkey. All I had to do was just get a fast donkey. And when I saw these guys suffer this like humiliating loss, it made me feel good that the purpose was right because it's not about anything that you want. It's about what the donkey wants. And if you can't tap into that, dude, you're in for a long day at the office. What I learned from running with the donkeys is just that, man. You've got to understand them where they respond to this and make it a combination of factors where they're digging it. Ultimately, this never would have worked if... I never could have imposed my will on Sherman. That was a losing battle right from the start. Um, No way it would have worked. So what I had to do instead 
was keep changing the factors and swapping things in and out until it all happened naturally. So we brought Zeke on board and then my, my, my wife Mika and then Flower and Matilda and we brought the Amish dudes over and our friend Ruby and we just kept swapping things in and out until it just became this very natural thing where now, if I'm not at the gate at nine o'clock in the morning, I can hear the donkeys banging their heads against the gate like, let's go dude, time to go. Like they're mm. ready to do it. So it makes I, I you think, run too. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing about it. Is like they, they're into it. They're going for it. And I think ultimately in the end, you know, if I, if I can take this sort of global lesson from it all, is that you, know, you can't just put your head down and bull forward in your job, relationships, or whatever. At some point, you just guys keep changing the factors around until it just feels good and it all flows. Mm. You know, when you're training with a donkey, you're going the donkey's pace. And you can learn to adjust that. You can get the donkey to go faster or slower over time. But essentially, the donkey is going to do what it wants to do when it wants to do it. And it's going to stop when it wants to stop. And you can modify that, that over time. But what I found was really cool about the donkey training is that it was so much more relaxed. It was so much more rhythmic. And there are so many un planned stops along the way. So like if donkey gets to a creek, whoa, it's going to slow down. It's going to smell the creek. You can have five minutes to just deal with the creek before you go into the water. And what I found was that over the course of like two years of running with donkeys, I feel so much better, like more resilient and less like sore and beat up from my running. And I think the thing that coaches always tell you, they always tell you, run below your anaerobic threshold, like oh, get your heart rate down, right? That's so hard to do. You never do it. You never do it. And I think Eric Horton told me this back in Born to Run days. He's like, you're doing your two, your easy days too hard and your hard days too easy. Like mm. you're never where you think you are. Donkeys get it, man. Like you run with a donkey, you're putting the same miles, but you're going to feel so much better. Totally. Thank you. Because I've been, uh, I've been injured like all year, just training, and then I get injured, and then I run too hard, and then I get injured, and I really want to do at least a marathon, let alone an ultra marathon. And I know you went straight to just an ultra marathon, so there's there's still hope for me. I'm just always <laughs> broken, and I run a pretty fast mile, so it's confusing. But what I was going to say is, you know, I don't think that donkey burrow racing is going to take off like crazy. I mean, the barrier to entry for that sport is a lot different than the barrier to entry just for an ultra marathon. Getting yeah, a donkey yeah. to Colorado isn't easy. <laughs> oh, man, it was, a, it was a total ass ache. Hauling that thing, 3,200 miles. But I don't know, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing more, though, is that uh, there's a thing called dog fit and canacross in the UK. What? And th yeah, yeah, so canacross is basically cross country with canines, but they are really systematizing methods for people to run with their dogs. So they have, like, waist harnesses, so you sort of put around your own waist instead of holding the leash in your hand. And... What, what people are trying to do is perfect ways for people to run with dogs. And my friend Luis Escobar, you know, he, he had this video which went super viral. He had like 20 million views immediately because he took his high school cross country team to a rescue shelter and had the kids run with the dogs. Mm. And oh my God, it's just heart melting. This one kid, like the dog got tired to so the little boy, you know, it's really like handsome young Latino kid, like picks this, this little dog up in his arms. And at the end of the video, Lewis reveals that that boy actually went back with his mom that afternoon and adopted that dog. Oh, like, that's so I cute. Know, right. Any advice to people who just want to have, I don't know, a better relationship with their animals themselves or get into burrow racing? Well, you know, the funny thing was one of the people I interviewed is kind of a controversial figure in animals, which is you know, Caesar Milan. Yeah, and, the dog whisperer. Yeah, man. So Caesar Milan has a huge following, but there's also been a pushback. There are certain dog behaviorists who challenge his methods. They, they think he's too aggressive. As an amateur, I dig the guy. And I went out to his dog psychology center and interviewed him and hung out with him. And I was, first of all, just blown away by his personal attention. I sent him that video of my friend Luis Escobar um, running with the rescue dogs. And I sent it to Cesar Milan. And I said, hey, would you mind if I bring this friend of mine down? And he's like, Cesar's like, yeah, sure, man, no problem. When we got there, he had that video memorized. 
And as soon as he met Lewis, he's like, hey, coach, good to meet you. Let me tell you. And he just started to break down what wow. all the kids were doing with the dogs. And he's like, this kid did this, and he should have done that. And I was like, holy Christmas. Like, this guy is serious about his profession. But essentially, <laughs> you can boil all of Cesar Milan's secrets, all of the, the millions and millions of dollars he's earned, all the thousands of dogs he's trained, it all comes down to one thing, which is just walk your dog, man. Just walk your dog. <laughs> and you watch his show, and I've watched dozens and dozens of episodes. He's amazing. But, you know, he, he'll be over at, like, Jerry Seinfeld's house or Oprah's or Tony Robbins' house. And these are, like, people who are masters of persuasion. And Cesar Milan's like, you know, Tony, you, you just got to walk your dog, man. Jerry, you, you got to walk that, you got to walk that poodle. Mm. So basically what he does, he just exercises. And I think that's, unfortunately, the secret of life that a lot of us ignore is just get out and shake your ass for a couple hours. Get out and shake your ass for a couple of hours. Whether it's just breathing in fresh air on a break from work or taking your pet on a run or even a walk, get outside preferably with an animal by your side for some quality company. If you don't have your own pet, you can go to a local adoption center, but take the time to snuggle up with your furry friends for your own mental health. And remember, keeping them happy helps keep you happy. Thanks so much to Chris for coming back on the show. This book was so much fun. I laughed so hard during our conversation. Running with Sherman hits shelves this October, so grab a copy. It's out right now, and go meet Chris at his book stops on the book tour. He'll be there for fun runs, videos, activities, and more, and maybe even do a video call with Sherman. I'm definitely going to hit his event in San Diego, so look him up at chrismcdougall.com to find out where. We're also going to try to go for another surf session, and if we do, this time I'll try to get pics and not lose my camera and post them on the Instagram account. To all of you writing reviews, thank you. It takes less time than making a cup of coffee and it fuels this podcast. So thank you so much to all of you for writing great reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you're listening to this show. This podcast is produced by REI with the help from Annie Fassler and Chelsea Davis. Tune in the week after next for an episode all about recycling, common myths about it, how we can do it more mindfully, and other tips for your everyday life. As always, I appreciate when you tell a friend or 10 and you subscribe to this show wherever you're listening. And remember, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. <laughs>